This is a production of Cornell University Library. Good afternoon and, and welcome everyone. Uh, I'm Sarah Wright, the Interim Director of Mann Library. And it's my pleasure to be here today and welcome you to our first Chats in the Stacks book talk of the 2020-2021 academic year, which also happens to be our first virtual book talk ever. Uh, I'm so happy that you have all been able to join us today. We have a fairly large crowd attending, which speaks to the advantages that a virtual event offers in terms of accessibility. Uh, so before introducing our speaker today, I would like to touch on just a few points. Uh, first, we do have a live captioning service associated with this event. So if you'd like to see the live captions, be sure to hit the toggle on your Zoom view. Second, much like our usual book talks, today's event will begin with our speakers presentation, which will then be followed by a question and answer session. You may submit your questions via chat in this webinar. Eveline Ferretti is on hand and she will be gathering the questions that come in and present them to Professor Raikow in the order that they were received. Uh, and last but not least, I'd also like to be sure to let you know that there are several more great chats in the Stacks book talks scheduled over the next six weeks. Uh, a couple of which we are hosting here at MAN, including a session about the comm stocks of Cornell and another about designing outdoor spaces effectively for children and youth. For details, I encourage you to check the schedule on the Cornell University Library Book Talk page, uh, the URL for which you're gonna see in the chat box in just a minute. Uh, and now it's my great pleasure to introduce to you our speaker for today. Don Raikow is an associate professor in the section of horticulture in Cornell University School of Integrative Plant Science. After receiving his PhD from Cornell University, Professor Raikow joined the faculty in 1987. From 1996 to 2013, he served as the Elizabeth Newman Wilds Director of the Cornell Botanic Gardens, having served as Associate Director from 1993 to 1995. As a faculty member teaching courses in public garden management, landscaping with annuals and perennials, nature and health, and the history of plant exploration, Dr. Raikow created and continues to co-direct the Cornell Graduate Program in Public Garden Leadership, a program that prepares graduates for the real life challenges of sustaining public gardens and preserving natural areas in a resource competitive world. Dr. Raikow has published extensively on the art, practice, and importance of keeping public gardens, including a forthcoming book, Public Gardens and Livable Cities, scheduled for release this coming November, as well as his previous book, Public Garden Management, which we were so pleased to feature as part of our Chats in the Stacks book talk series in 2011. Professor Raikow has also focused his research and engagement on a particularly timely topic, the impact of time spent in nature on human health and behavior. He directs the Nature Prescription at Cornell program, as well as the na nationwide Campus Nature Prescription Network. And in 2019, he published today's feature title, Nature Prescription, Improving College Student Mental Health. Please join me in giving Don a warm welcome as he presents this important opening talk in our book talk series for this fall semester. Thank you, Sarah, uh, for that very generous introduction. And it really is a great pleasure for me to be here today and to be speaking to all of you wherever you are. I, in fact, particularly appreciate that each of you are spending the next hour not outside on a glorious afternoon, but instead staring at your laptops uh, as I speak. So after this book talk, I recommend that everyone go out in nature for a while. As Sarah mentioned, I've been working uh, on the development and the implementation of the Nature Rx at Cornell program for the past several years. And in 2017, co authored with the late Dr. Greg Eels the text Nature Rx Improving College Student Mental Health, which was published by Cornell University Press. I'd like to speak a bit about my co-author, the late Greg Eels. He was an exceptional individual who devoted his life to improving the lives of students at the universities where he taught. 
uh, the communities in which he lived and the church at which he worshiped. I would like to dedicate this talk to Greg Eels. I'd also like to start by reading the first paragraph of our Nature Rx book, because I think it really sets the stage for what I'll be speaking about subsequently. In contemporary culture, we are increasingly disconnected from our roots in the natural world. The majority of us live in densely populated urban areas and spend more time in front of a screen than in the woods. Significant social change has contributed to fewer people being intentionally engaged with nature. This increasing disconnection seems related to a growing number of physical and mental health problems. Institutions of higher education, the diverse collection of colleges and universities around the world, are in a unique position to develop programs to reverse this trend. And in this presentation, I will be talking about how our university, Cornell, has developed a Nature Rx program. Well, it's no surprise to any of you that we are living in a highly stressed and anxious time. The layered effects of the global climate uh, pandemic, the economic recession, the protests for racial justice, and a highly polarized electorate have left just about everyone in a state of high anxiety and that is perhaps even more true for college age students than for any other segment of our population. Just a couple of weeks ago, the New York Times in their checkup column published an article, Young Adults Pandemic Mental Health Risks. In a new CDC survey, 18 to 24 year olds reported the highest level of symptoms of anxiety and depression, and a quarter of them said that they had seriously considered suicide. How tragic. That was followed up by an article just this week in the Huffington Post. There was a college mental health crisis before COVID now it may be getting even worse. The pandemic is increasing anxiety and depression among young adults. And that article goes on to describe a number of ways in which young people can protect their own mental health. Well, imagine if I told you about a new medication that would reduce stress, anxiety, and depression, improve energy levels, sleep patterns, and ability to concentrate, and even improve recall of facts. Would you be interested in acquiring such a medication? Well, in fact, an increasing body of evidence confirms that being active in nature or sitting passively in nature <clears throat> or even viewing a, <clears throat> a picture of nature can provide a number of short-term health benefits and can even provide impact over many years. These benefits are divided into three primary categories. A paper by Frumkin, um, and Bratman published in 2017 called Nature Contact and Human Health, a research agenda, spoke about the psychological benefits I've already mentioned, reduced stress, reduced anxiety, reduced depression, as well as a number of improved behavioral 
or attitudinal benefits, such as greater happiness or life satisfaction, reduced aggression, and increased social connection. Finally, the authors presented a number of physiological benefits, of which some have a greater degree of scientific backing at this point than do others. But these included ones like an improved ability to concentrate and improved memory recall, lowered blood pressure, improved post-operative recovery, improved birth outcomes and pain control, reduced diabetes and obesity and improved eyesight, improved immune functioning, which we'll come back to later, and even in a large uh, study that was done of American nurses over a number of years, reduced mortality. Now, the belief in the benefits of spending time in nature has precedents that stretch back thousands of years. In fact, Aristotle, in his On the Parts of Animals, stated, for in all natural things, there is something marvelous. And William Shakespeare, in his Trolius and Cressida, stated, one touch of nature makes the whole world kin. So why do we humans value nature so highly? The famed biologist E.O. Wilson popularized our innate connection to nature with the phrase biophilia. Wilson did not invent this phrase, but he certainly popularized it and wrote a book about the human bond with other species. The basic premise for the biophilic hypothesis is that we humans have evolved from a species that depended entirely on nature for sustenance, for clothing and shelter, and also for the identification of dangers. As we have continued to evolve, we still have this connection to nature, but often we humans don't recognize it. So in recent years, much research has focused on the ways that nature contributes to our overall well-being. It starts in childhood, and in the mid-1990s, excuse me, uh, early 2000s, the author Richard Louvre wrote the seminal text, Last Child in the Woods, Saving Our Children from Nature Deficit Disorder. His theory is that children require time in nature and that depriving them of nature experiences is detrimental to their well-being. Young people who spend the majority of their time in front of video screens rather than playing outdoors are more susceptible to chronic stress and other negative psychological conditions. Habitual stress can start in early childhood or the middle childhood years, or certainly often in the teen years. And that habitual stress can carry from the youthful period into a young adulthood or the college years. There have been three stark recent reports that have painted a portrait of university students in crisis. The first of these, the 2019 National College Health Assessment, was conducted by the American College Health Association, and it reported that 45% of respondents felt that they had experienced a high degree of stress and anxiety in the previous six months. 
Similarly, a, the Center for Collegiate Mental Health found in 2019 that average rates of student self-reported anxiety and depression had increased over the past eight years. Finally, the annual survey of American freshmen found that the levels of stress, anxiety, depression, and self-hurt were the highest in 2019 that they have ever reported. So let's delve now into the evidence that time in nature provides direct health benefits. Earlier, I laid out these various benefits, but I'm sure you would like to know what some of the research is that backs up these findings. Physiological stress is commonly monitored through salivary cortisol levels, the saliva in our mouths. A number of studies, particularly several that have been done in Japan, have compared homogenous cohorts of individuals who were asked to either spend a certain amount of time in a nature setting or an equal amount of time on an urban street. And in all of these research projects, they strove to make the individuals participating as homogenous as possible. What they have found, without exception, is that the nature walkers have greatly reduced levels of salivary cortisol, whereas the urban walkers experience no decline or even, in fact, increases in cortisol levels. So part of being a young child and exploring your world is getting your hands dirty. And for as long as there have been kids getting their hands dirty, there have been parents and caregivers telling them to wash their hand. Well, interestingly, according to Jack Gilbert and Rob Knight, the co-authors of Dirt is Good, um, the advantages of germs for your child's developing immune system, our addiction to indoor-based, uber-clean lifestyles is actually weakening our children's defense systems against illness. This can be explained, at least in part, by relatively recent discoveries about a, a form of bacterium, Mycobacterium vacae, that are non-pathogenic and are commonly found in soils. When introduced into mice, these Mycobacterium vacae simulated a, excuse me, stimulated a newly discovered group of neurons, which in turn increased levels of serotonin. And as many of you know, serotonin is associated with feelings of well-being and happiness. They also decreased levels of anxiety. Plants themselves can impact our stress levels. Phytoncides are volatile organic chemicals that are given off by many plants, garlic, uh, other members of the onion family, as well as oaks, cedar, locusts, and pines. When these molecules are taken in through our nasal passages, they have been shown to both reduce blood pressure by reducing sympathetic nerve activity and to boost the immune functioning of the body by enhancing natural killer or NK cell activity. Hiroki Harada and her colleagues at Kagoshima University in Japan revealed in a recent study that sniffing linalool, which is an alcohol component given off by 
lavender, as we see here, had the same effect on a mouse's brain as feeding it Valium, but without the dizzying side effects of that drug. In addition to identifying those properties in soil and plants that provide human health benefits, an exciting recent research thrust has been an examination of the physiological and the biological mechanisms underlying such benefits. Research done at the University of Illinois by Francis Quo has focused on the role of these human natural killer or NK cells that I just mentioned. The NK cells are associated with boosting immune functioning and providing rapid response to viral infected cells. In two Japanese experiments that were also done quite recently, a three-day trip to a forested site resulted in increased NK cell activities and the expression of anti-cancer proteins in the body of participants. These effects lasted for several days, particularly for female participants. Let's switch now to the college-aged audience and some recent research that I've had the opportunity to participate in. Colleagues at Cornell and I were very interested in how the uh, activities of participating in nature and having pro-environmental attitudes toward nature among college students were formed earlier in life. So in a study to be published in the upcoming issue of Frontiers in Psychology, we looked at this potential correlation between activities and attitudes among children in their middle childhood years, uh, seven to 11 or 12, and their engagement with and attitudes toward nature as current undergraduates. So in 2018, we invited Cornell undergraduates to participate in a 21 question study that examine things such as during your middle childhood years, did you reside in a large city, a small city or town, a suburb or a rural area, as well as what types of nature activities did you participate in in your middle childhood years and how frequently did you participate? We received over 300 completed surveys. And what we found is that when we asked uh, the participants to describe the type of environment they had around them, there were distinct differences depending upon where they grew up. So for the urban dwellers, a word cloud emphasized school, lots, city, house, apartment, urban. Then in the small city, there started to be more trees, homes, suburban, outside. And then in the suburban site, house was still emphasized, but outside home, tree, area, backyard became more prevalent. And then finally in the rural area, cornfields, horses, rural forest woods. So you can see real changes taking place depending upon where these young people resided in their middle childhood years. Our analysis showed that there was a significant drop off in the amount of time that young people spend out in nature between what they reported 
in their middle child for their middle childhood years and what they report for how frequently they're out in nature today. But we did find that there was a significant and direct correlation between nature engagement in middle childhood years and nature engagement as current Cornell undergrads. Furthermore, we found that there was a direct correlation between nature engagement in middle childhood years and positive attitudes about nature as current uh, undergrads. So clearly, the middle childhood years were formative and were important in framing both attitude and behavior today. We also asked students when they're feeling stressed at school, in what ways do they seek relief? And we were gratified to see that while talking to friends and family was the number one cited way of relieving stress, spending time out in nature ranked number two. And we thought, well, that's great. Students really have discovered that spending time in nature is important for their health and well-being. But then we asked them, honestly, how frequently do you go out in nature? And most of the respondents said less than once a week or almost never. So there was a real disconnect between what they know they should be doing and what they're actually doing. That says to us that we need more effective messaging to college undergraduates about the value of going out in nature. So once we had established that time in nature is valuable and um, can build on habits that formed earlier in life, other Cornell colleagues and I were interested in the question, what is the minimum time dose to spend in a natural setting to positively impact the mental health of college-age students? So in a uh, research piece that was published recently in Frontiers in Psychology, Colleagues and I conducted a scoping review. We started with over a thousand papers and winnowed that down to 14 that specifically addressed this topic. And we found that when equal durations are spent in a natural setting versus an urban setting, as little as 10 minutes can have a positive and statistically significant impact on a variety of psychological markers. These findings are consistent with an earlier study done by Mary Carol Hunter and her associates at the University of Michigan, in which they used two markers, salivary cortisol level and also alpha amylase, to determine the appropriate amount of time to spend out in nature to positively impact these markers. And they too found that the greatest effect was at about the 20 minute mark. Um, certainly these markers declined further after 20 minutes, but the slope of the line declined greatly meaning that there was a decreasing return on time investment. So bottom line, 10 to 20 minutes spent outdoors two to three times a week can positively impact the psychological markers and therefore the well-being of young people. Several years ago, some other colleagues and I were on a coffee break from a long day-long meeting and we somehow got to discussing 
the fact that Cornell is regularly rated to have one of the most beautiful campuses in America. And yet, we have one of the high rates of psychological mental health issues among our student body. And we thought there must be some way to utilize the beauty of this campus to improve the health and well being of our student body. And that really was the genesis for what came to be called Nature Rx at Cornell. Its mission, as you can see here, is to reduce stress and thereby increase physical and mental health in students through their engagement with nature and to cultivate in students an increased appreciation of nature. What I'd like to do now is walk you through several of the steps that have been involved in the creation and growth of the Nature Rx program at Cornell. But before I do that, I would like to give a shout out to a few of the administrators who have been so supportive of the Nature Rx program. First, Vice President of Student and Campus Life, Ryan Lombardi, who is supporting the Campus Nature Rx Symposium, I'll speak about later. Secondly, Dean of Students, Vijay Pendakur, uh, and Vijay, we will miss you. And thirdly, Catherine Thrasher Carroll, the Director of the Scorton Center for Health Initiatives at Cornell Health. Well, speaking of Cornell Health, nearly every member of the Cornell student body winds up at the health clinic sometime during the year, at least in a normal year. Students suffering from anxiety, stress, depression, sleep deprivation, obesity, or inactivity, or social isolation can be prescribed time in nature as part of their overall treatment. The Nature Prescription Program is currently being expanded at Cornell Health based on the Park Prescription Program originally developed by Dr. Robert Zarr, who you see in this slide and who developed and is now the medical authority for Park Rx America. When we, in conjunction with Cornell Health, first developed the approach to nature prescriptions, we developed this little quarter card that says, spend time in nature. And it asked students to go out a couple or three times a week to spend time in nature and the health provider would then sign that card. Well, we know that students get a lot of paperwork. Sometimes they pay attention to it and other times it goes into the trash or recycling. So more recently, we have been able to have Nature Rx actually added to the student's electronic health record. And as you can see here, there actually is a box to check, Nature Rx discussed and recommended. And this past academic year, even before it was curtailed, there were 1,050 Nature Rx prescriptions that were provided to students. Also in this previous 2019-2020 academic year, staff at Cornell Health had devised a confidential and anonymous way of surveying each of the students who had received this Nature Rx prescription. Our goals in sending the students these surveys were to discover 
was this prescription being effective? That is, were the students actually spending more time in nature? If so, how was it impacting them in terms of stress levels, social engagement, or even academic performance? Well, as we all know, the pandemic happened. And as a result, we've had to postpone this surveying of students, but plan to return to it uh, in a future academic year. A third component of the Nature RX program is our interactive Nature RX website, uh, naturerx.cornell.edu. In it, we provide photos, descriptions, and GPS based directions to 16 natural and horticultural sites around campus, most of which are managed by Cornell Botanic Gardens. For each of the sites, we describe what the natural or landscaped features are, at what time of the year that site is most attractive or interesting, and the GPS feature allows us to provide walking directions from wherever the user is currently accessing the site to the nearest natural area. We feel that this is important because we want students to get over the mindset that nature is all well and good, but I don't have two hours to devote to that. Based on the research that I've spoken about and based on the use of a website like this, students can spend as little as 10 to 20 minutes and actually gain the benefits of time in nature. We are also working with the communications arm of Cornell Health to develop a series of PDF slides that depict benefits of time in nature. And these slides are being projected on media walls uh, at various sites around campus, uh, dormitories, dining halls, the foyers of academic buildings. Currently, the set of slides are based on a lead-in of, did you know that? So did you know that spending time in nature can improve your social life? improve your exam scores, and improve your sleep patterns. And for each of these, we provide studies that have verified uh, these benefits. We like this approach because as effective as we believe the nature prescriptions are, they reach just those students who are being prescribed time in nature, whereas these images on university media walls are seen by everyone. A fourth component of this program is the Nature RX course, Plant Science 1125. There are two simple goals in this program. One is to expose students to the variety of natural and landscape sites that are available on and very near to campus. And the other is to have each of the registered students develop a closer, more intimate relationship with the natural world. And we do this by having students write reflective essays on the experiences that they have had uh, on a weekly basis, as well as through readings and class discussions. Here you see Dr. Robert Zarr leading a session in forest therapy when he visited campus last September. 
in the Nature Rx course, students are exposed to a range of experiences and in all types of weather, including uh, last year, a late fall visit and series of exercises at the Hoffman Challenge course um, up on Mount Pleasant. So an applied research project I'm currently engaged in with colleagues at UC Davis involves looking at the impact of nature RX courses. Both I and they uh, administered surveys to the students after the first class of the semester. And we again issued almost identical surveys after the last class of the semester. And through that, we were able to determine that students improve their overall attitudes about nature, that they felt that nature was an effective tool to use when they're feeling very stressed, and that they share their joy and love of nature with their fellow students. I've been talking thus far about students in a very generic manner, but I want to emphasize now that a major goal of the Nature Rx program is to engage all students, regardless of their background, their major, their race or ethnicity, engage all students in the benefits that the natural world is right out there and has in store. A fifth component of the Nature Rx at Cornell program is a Nature Rx student club. Members of the club uh, work on a variety of, acti of planning activities, such as nature walks, um, cleanups of natural areas, invasive plant removals, geocaching contests, trips to nearby or regional parks, and for wintertime, snowshoeing and cross-country skiing. Building on the success of the Nature Rx program at Cornell, we have now developed a nationwide network of campus nature rx programs um, as of this date there are 25 programs scattered throughout the u.s each week i send out an electronic newsletter to all of the, the participants so that we can share ideas programs that have worked or not worked and explore ways of collaborating. This coming October 23rd, Cornell will be hosting a day-long virtual symposium uh, for the Campus Nature Rx Network. Um, we will have a keynote speaker of the researcher, Dr. Michelle Kondo from the U.S. Forest Service and six representatives from campuses that are part of the network will each talk about how they have framed their Nature Rx program for their campus and how they are detecting the impact of their program. So I would like to conclude by saying that we are in an exceptional time. We all know that. Many students here at Cornell and around the country are taking courses virtually, in part, or entirely. This is a particularly cogent time to sit back and reflect on the meaning of the physical campus. The buildings, the infrastructure, and yes, the green spaces that make up 
our college and university campuses can have a lasting impression on the students studying at that campus, can increase their interest in and memories of their alma mater, and can soothe troubled minds in these very difficult times. This is what we are trying to achieve through the Nature Rx at Cornell program. So I thank you, and at this point, would be happy to address any questions that have come in through Eveline. Thank, thank you so much, Don. That was just a, that was a wonderful talk. I, I uh, really, really appreciated learning all about the, the program. Um, yes, we do have a question, a couple of questions. Um, the first one is from Brenna, and her question is, how does the Nature Rx program continue or shift at all in wintertime when the status of nature really changes and access to outside is not the same? Is there an optimal time of day or a time of week to spend time in nature to receive the maximum benefit? So that was actually two questions. The first being about winter time and the second one being about optimal time of day and week to spend outdoors. Addressing winter first, um, it is critical to any Nature Rx program to recognize the change of seasons in those parts of the country that experience a significant change of season, and that certainly includes us. Um, on NPR a few days ago, there was a report about a Norwegian mindset, and I would not even begin to try to uh, pronounce the word, but it is an approach among Norwegian people of going out and enjoying the winter time based on the premise that there is no bad weather, there's just inappropriate clothing. And Norwegians not only engage in winter sports, snowshoeing, sledding, cross country and downhill skiing, they also, according to this NPR report, will go outside in winter with friends and have tea or coffee to enjoy the beauty of all that is around them. There is no doubt that winter has an incomparable beauty that cannot be duplicated in verdant summertime. It's also very true that sometimes in winter, the weather is absolutely atrocious. And I'm the first person to say that not all days in winter are equally appropriate for being outside. But if we think about our winter weather here in Ithaca or truly anywhere in the Northeast, many days are relatively minor of mild temperatures in the 30s or 40s. Um, and that's when one can truly enjoy winter. Second question, Eveline, had to do with the ideal amount of time to spend out in, in nature. Actually, it was the optimal, optimal. So the time of day, optimal time of day and optimal time, you know, time of the day of the week, if you could just, if you had any suggestions there. I really feel that there is no optimal time of day or certainly day of the week to be out in nature. Again, we all have to be aware of and responsive to whatever the current weather conditions are. So in July or August during the heat of summer, going out in midday is probably less comfortable than going for a walk in the morning or at dusk. As the days become shorter and as we lose daylight savings time, um, going out during the relatively lower uh, or, or shorter period of time when it is actually light becomes more important. So again, I think we need to be 
responsive, respectful of the current weather uh, and season and plan our nature ventures accordingly. All right, thank you. Thank you, Don. Um, I'm just going to also, what I should have said uh, before is for anybody listening and didn't, who didn't might not have caught my chat message, if you do have a question for us, um, just uh, type it to us here in the chat, on, in the chat um, window that you see at the bottom of, the, um, of your Zoom view. So our next question is, is from Colin, and he asks, does Nature Rx work with any undergraduate organizations, programs, or clubs around campus to facilitate student engagement outdoors? Oh, I'm so glad that Colin asked that. <coughs> and yes, the Nature Rx Club is now under the umbrella of Cornell Minds Matter, a very large and very well-established uh, student organization. So the Nature Rx Club is coordinating events and activities through CMM, Cornell Minds Matter. All right, thank Next you, Don. Question. Next question was from Jules. It was actually about that date of the day long event you met, mentioned. Would you repeat that? And will it be, uh, we need to know the date again. Um, we missed so that. The and then will it, be, is, will it be Zoomed? Will it be on Zoom? Yes, uh, the date is Friday, October 23rd. It will be on Zoom and people can register for it by simply Googling. Uh, Campus Nature Rx, and the registration website will come up and you can register from there. We currently have 116 people registered, but being a Zoom symposium, there's no limit on numbers, so we welcome everyone for that. Wonderful. So the next question is actually, uh, Don, you might be able to answer this as the uh, um, former director, emeritus director of, uh, of Cornell Botanic Gardens. Uh, Jill comments, the last time I went to the Cornell Botanic Garden, the gate block, the, the gate blocked access, making parking very limited. Do you happen to know whether this has changed to make it easier to go for walks or what would, what would you suggest in that, in that, in that instance? I think the questioner is referring to the gates for the FR Newman Arboretum because the botanical garden is completely gate free and open 24 seven. But in the Arboretum, the gates were being kept locked uh, earlier in the pandemic. Uh, I've been down recently when uh, the gates were open, uh, but Cornell Botanic Gardens is asking everyone to please maintain social distance and to make sure that even when outside, because the Arboretum is quite popular, to please wear masks. Don, our next question is from Lawanda. Have you seen any differences in the use of Nature Rx with or by students of diverse backgrounds? Um, she would appreciate suggestions for students with physical disabilities who may find it harder to navigate the campus. First of all, hello, Lawanda. Good to hear from you. And um, I'm going to answer that question um, in two parts. Um, first, we know that based on a number of studies that have been done. Um, traditionally, people of color and particularly African Americans um, have utilized uh, nature sites, green spaces, less often um, than have white audiences. That should not be, <coughs> excuse me, because as I mentioned earlier, Nature doesn't recognize color. Nature does not recognize ethnicity. So another study, which I did not report on today, has been conducted by a colleague at the College of William and Mary and myself, in which we look at what are the primary barriers to greater use of parks and green spaces by young people of color. 
Through that study, we identified a number of common barriers, and we've also identified ways of overcoming those barriers and making parks more inclusive, more diverse, and more welcoming of all people. And we will be publishing that study very shortly. To the second part of Lawanda's question, we are still not doing as well in making our green areas and nature sites as open and inclusive for all people, regardless of ability, as we should. There are many parks that have provided um, ADA accessible trails um, and overlooks, um, but not as many as there should be. And this needs to be a goal over the next decade. I'd like to add a third part to that two-part response. And that is, we have been extremely heartened over the course of the pandemic, that if there is any silver lining in the horrors of what this country and the world has been, have been experiencing, it is that people have been going out into nature in absolutely unprecedented numbers. Our um, federal parks, state parks, regional and local parks, public gardens and other green spaces have been utilized in numbers never before seen. And on the one hand, this is a great thing, and it shows, it really supports that biophilic hypothesis that I spoke about earlier. On the other hand, there are some parks that feel that they've actually been getting overrun. I say that's a good problem to have rather than parks that sit idle. But to make parks truly utilized as well as they possibly can be, they need to be equally accessible for all individuals. And I won't add a fourth part to that two-part response. <laughs> Thank you, Don. Don, the last, um, oh no, no, second to last, actually. Um, uh, so, sorry, so one comment was from Bird. It's a, more of a comment than a, than a, than a question, um, noting that as a Cornell student years ago, my future husband and I walked outside almost every day in rain, snow, hail, and minus 20 degree weather. That was when it did <laughs> get that cold back in the day. Um, and, and the important thing, and this is a great advice for, for, the, for, the, uh, for the season ahead, the important thing was to be dressed appropriately. So that was a comment from, from Bird. And then we have a, another, a final um, question or comment from Helene. I'm sorry if I'm not, Helene, Helena. Um, Professor Don, Professor Rico, you led a Huntington Library and Gardens tour in Pasadena, California, which was so excellent and special that your, oops, I'm sorry, I have to copy this over because I can't read it on my screen. I apologize. Let me try that again. Um, oops, excuse me. So starting that again, Don, Professor Rakow, you led a Huntington Library and Gardens tour in Pasadena, California, which was so excellent and special that your insights continue with us today, though your brilliant tour was years ago. Thank you. Hope you will return west. See you alum, Helena Rose and Princeton husband. And, 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 and a Princeton husband. So that's a great, that's a great, that's a great comment. That's a great question. Not really a question, but statement to end, end on, Don. <laughs> Congratulations. Well, thanks so much for that, Helene. And I do recall that tour very, very fondly. And I'm extremely fond of the Huntington Library and Gardens, really one of the cultural jewels of this country. And when we are allowed to travel again, I look forward to returning there. Thank you so much, Don, and, and thank you to everyone in attendance for, for making this a, a wonderful first virtual Chats in the Stacks. Um, I think the biggest lesson I've learned is I need to uh, get a better winter coat so I can be outside this winter and enjoy nature. <laughs>
Um, and just by way of reminder, our next virtual Chats in the Stacks book talk is going to take place on Thursday, October 1st at 4.30. Our presenter will be Karen Pender St. Clair, also of the section of horticulture at Cornell. And she will be discussing her book, The Comstocks of Cornell, The Definitive Autobiography. Uh, you can register for this event using the link that's going to be posted in the chat shortly. Uh, and we hope to see you there. Uh, and I hope everyone has a wonderful weekend. I think it's supposed to be beautiful weather and sunshine. So I hope we all can get out and enjoy. Thank you, everybody. This has been a production of Cornell University Library.